All right, so thank you, everybody, uh, for coming to my talk. I'm going to be talking about using carbon nanomaterials for en efficient energy device applications. Um, so I really want to start off with this slide. And so this is actually a slide that Professor Richard Smalley put together uh, a while back. And so what he did is he went to, uh, after about two years of touring around and giving talks, before each talk, he would actually ask the crowd uh, the same question, which is what they saw as being the top 10 problems uh, that we're going to face as, human the as humans in the next 50 years. And so what happens is he get these, all this input, and then he'd go back to his office, and he, would, he, would, uh, he listed all these things, as you can see here, and he conveniently put energy on top. And the reason for doing this, which actually makes a lot of sense to me, is that if you're able to solve the energy problem, uh, which faces us today, then you can, uh, if not solve, you can influence all the, under, all the under problems underneath this. For example, if you have unlimited amounts of energy, then you have the ability to create clean water uh, or, or find new ways to make food. And so ultimately, energy is the infrastructure problem that we face uh, in, this, in this idea. And so uh, this is particularly an issue as we go forward in the future because uh, in the next 40 years, we're looking at adding another 2 billion people to our global population, uh, as, you, as you can see here. So this is becoming more dire. Sorry. OK, and so what, what is the specific challenge that we face? And so this is what this plot shows you, specifically that uh, over time, we're having an increased, we're, we're facing an increased demand due to things like uh, industrialization uh, and, and urbanization, uh, as well as a modern society. But we're running out of energy resources, and particularly things like gas and oil very quickly. So at 2100, what it's going to look like is that we're going to be on our way down in terms of running out of coal. Uh, we're going to be pretty much exhausted out of gas and, and, and oil, and we're going to be facing a demand that is, uh, that is bigger than what we faced in the last 100 years. So the question is, what will fill this gap? Uh, what is a new oil that we can put in here? And so you may be able to say, well, what about solar energy? Uh, could we actually fill that gap with solar? Well, the problem is, is that solar is extremely expensive, even with silicon. Uh, for many reasons. And right now, at this point in time, it's uh, about 45 times more, or 40 times more or so more expensive than coal. Uh, and that's why it only makes up about 3%. It's, it's part of about 3% of renewable uh, energy resources that we use, which also uh, is comprised of things like geothermal and wind power. Uh, so whereas fossil fuels, which makes up the most of this, uh, is globally 68%, and in the US, is about 80%. So what you may not think about, though, is in the process of transitioning from your Commodore 64 to your uh, new MacBook, is that you, we're also having a society where uh, modernization involves more power. So we need more transistors. We need more computing power. Uh, and this is also turning into a problem. But what you may not realize is that modernization itself is driven by the fact that we have energy. And so the fact that uh, twenty five percent of our energy resources are based on the food and healthcare care systems uh, really has driven us to an average world life expectancy that 's now almost thirty years what it was a few hundred thirty years higher than what it was a few hundred years ago so as these uh, infrastructure uh, systems are most impacted by the global energy crisis, the question is is that if we don 't solve this problem, uh, what will happen to humans in three hundred years, and what new challenges will we face so uh, as after I uh, introduce my talk, uh, this, is, this is the sort of thing I'll be talking about. Uh, so first, I'm going to be talking to you about the transfer of self-assembled single-wall carbon nanotubes as templates for new energy devices. Uh, then I'm going to be talking about a new, a new form of solid-state energy materials uh, from this, this, this material architecture. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking more about nanocarbon templates as back contacts uh, for efficient solar-to-fuel conversion devices. So before I go into this uh, much further, I'm going to first introduce to you what a carbon nanotube is. So the simplest idea of what a carbon nanotube is is that if you take a, 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 some graphite, which is pencil lead, and you rip off the top layer of carbon atoms, and then from that you cut a rectangle out of those carbon atoms and you roll it up into a cylinder, you get a carbon nanotube. And how you actually cut that rectangle out from the graphene sheet uh, determines 
this chiral angle, which determines the properties of the carbon nanotube itself. So single wall carbon nanotubes typically are a few nanometers uh, down to about one nanometer in diameter, or even less, uh, and have different properties, which actually uh, uh, is based on this, this chiral angle. So why are we interested in single wall carbon nanotubes in the first place? Well, if I told you there was a material out there that had the thermal conductivity of diamond, it could support three orders of magnitude more current density than conventional metals like copper. And then on top of that, it had 100 times the strength of steel at one sixth of the weight. You'd probably say, wow, you know, this, 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 could, this could really displace a billion dollar industry in terms of materials. And that's true. These properties are incredible. But the challenge is that these properties actually exist on the, on the level of a single molecule, right? So the challenge in all of this is trying to make carbon nanotube-based materials that, that can retain these, these properties on sort of a macroscopic length scale. And of course, uh, as you may know, uh, I've, I've heard this from a few people about this company, which originated not too far away from here. There's a company out there which is doing some incredible stuff with carbon nanotubes. Uh, and this is Nanocomp. And so they're making things like carbon nanotube wires. Uh, they're uh, envisioning going into satellites. Uh, they're making carbon nanotube mats, which can be sort of put into laminates for next generation uh, carbon nanotube armor. But the obstacle that they're facing, just like everyone else in this field, is the fact that when you take a single nanotube and you put it into uh, this, this array of, 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 of jumbled nanotubes, uh, you lose the mechanical, thermal, and electrical properties that make these things so good. Instead, you're actually limited by the properties that exist at the junctions of nanotubes instead of the nanotubes themselves. So the world's strongest material turns into something that uh, just basically falls apart because the, the mechanical properties aren't very good. And so how do you get around that? Well, so what I've, I've really uh, came to build up is the ability to grow single wall carbon nanotube, carbon nanotubes in these self-assembled, vertically aligned carbon nanotube uh, materials. And so the idea is this. Uh, we, we grow them from a, a flat silicon wafer. And the, the magic to this is just depositing a 10 nanometer thick layer of alumina and then depositing uh, a very thin layer of, of iron on top. And the idea is the iron has relatively high surface energy, so it's going to form a bunch of little small islands, which are going to be nucleation sites for nanotubes. And now when you grow these in a CVD system or a chemical vapor deposition system, the nanotubes are going to interlock, and they're going to grow upward in a self-assembled nature. And what the benefit of this type of material is that from, from this side to this side, it's uh, one nanotube across, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's this mat of aligned nanotubes. So this is a really exciting concept. And just to give you a feeling for uh, the sort of system that makes this growth possible, uh, this is a system that I, it's a schematic of a system that I built up in order to grow these tubes. Uh, and, and one of the key things in the system is the ability to reduce the catalyst very quickly uh, using this hot filament. So in a hydrogen environment, you, you energize a hot filament. And it, you, you can actually do this at temperatures uh, that are high enough to disassociate hydrogen into atomic hydrogen. And that's one of the best reducing agents for the metal catalyst, which is very small in diameter. So you have to reduce it very quickly once you put it into the growth system and expose carbon. The next thing is that you put in a, a gate valve in order to, to very rapidly uh, put the sample in uh, and take the sample out and close off the gate valve and load and unload the sample, uh, which, which keeps you from having to ever expose the system to air, uh, which is a big benefit of this since uh, oxygen is a contaminant to this process. The other thing is to get around the, the CVD curse, uh, is what I call it. So you do two identical experiments on two different days, and you get two completely different results. Uh, which is the bane of most graduate students and postdocs. Uh, I have an in-situ mass spectrometer, which tells me that if that does happen, I can tell you the exact reason, you know, background levels of, of contaminants and things of, of why this is happening so I can get into the science of this growth process. So ultimately, I, you know, a lot of my work was focused on growth of, of single wall carbon nanotube arrays. What I'm really going to show you today is a transition into the energy devices uh, based on materials like this that are self-assembled uh, from the growth phase. So as I, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the things about this material is that it's grown on an aluminum oxide dielectric material or aluminum oxide layer. And this is not conductive. Uh, and so ultimately, what we have to do is we have to transfer this material off to a material that does have a good electrical interface if we want to make an energy device from this. And so uh, what, I, what I started with is this concept that uh, these vertically aligned carbon nanotube rays, I'm sorry. So these, these vertically aligned carbon nanotube rays have a structure 
uh, this, this vertically oriented structure very similar to the, that of the bottom of a gecko foot. And so uh, the way that a gecko could stick on the wall is that it, it basically presses its foot against the wall and these little hairs uh, compress. And the side walls of the hairs have a little bit more van der Waals interaction with the wall uh, than the ends of the hairs. And so that's actually enough to hold up the gecko against the force of gravity. Uh, and so you can see uh, Professor Liming Dai wrote a book on carbon nanotechnology, and he conveniently uh, hung this from this very small uh, little half centimeter by half centimeter patch of carbon nanotubes, very clearly demonstrating that this thing can hold uh, millions of times its own weight, uh, which is very exciting. So the idea that I thought of is that, well, you know, instead of uh, using this as an adhesive, what if I use that concept to imagine that, okay, now if I'm a gecko and I put my foot on the wall, and I compress those hairs down, and, and then someone goes in and, and etches away the chemical bonds that hold the, the hairs in the gecko foot uh, very strongly. And so now it's all van der Waals interaction. When the gecko goes to put it, pull its foot off the wall, the hairs will stick on the wall. Uh, and of course, the gecko will fall down. And that wouldn't be good. But ultimately, that's what I did here. So I, I removed the interface between the nanotubes and the catalyst particles uh, by using a water vapor etch in high temperatures, 750 degrees C. Uh, and so that actually uh, made the system so that I could basically just contract, contact transfer off these nanotube films uh, using a simple shear approach technology, or a simple shear approach. And of course, you could make this, I've transferred these to probably uh, over 50 different types of services. Uh, it's not service energy dependent simply because it depends on van der Waals interactions. So you can do this a little bit more efficiently if you use photolithography to pattern these catalyst, uh, these catalyst particles into structures. And so I patterned them into lines that are one to two microns wide, and then grew these vertically aligned again in the CVD system. And now I went through the same uh, water vapor etch and etched away the interface between the catalyst and the nanotubes. And now I'm able to bring the, the surface down and transfer off the nanotubes uh, very efficiently. Uh, and this forms these horizontal lines. So they were originally grown vertically, but now they're, they're transferred off horizontally. And what you can see here, this is actually a diamond window uh, this is half centimeter by half centimeter. And you can see this, these are lines of nanotubes transferred to the diamond window. And this is the very nice footprint of the, the nanotubes left behind on the growth chip. In fact, you can even see a few straying edges of the, the nanotube lines straying off the diamond window, which is, which is kind of neat. So if you look under the optimal microscope of the, at that diamond window, this is the sort of thing that you'll see. Uh, and so you see these very nice sort of lines of nanotubes uh, that are uh, reasonably uh, very well aligned uh, based on the growth process. So uh, the end, at the end of the day, we've used nature to do the hard part, which is aligning these really long nanotubes. And then we're doing, I'm doing the easy part, which is simply transferring them off from one surface to the next. And so what I convinced myself is that, well, if you're able to do more than one transfer, then ideally you could make any structure that you wanted to out of these aligned nanotube materials. And so you have this excellent template for making uh, self-assembled materials for a lot of different types of applications. And so what I did is I, I first transferred one set of lines, as you can see here. And then I, I went back and, and uh, on the same growth substrate that I transferred off of, I grew another set of lines. And then I transferred again, except this time I rotated the transfer substrate by 90 degrees. And so I ended up with this nice grid of lines. And this is, of course, my Photoshop rendition of this. Uh, and this is a closer view. And you can, you can sort of see the, the vertical alignment uh, at the overlap region here between the two lines. So the beauty of this is that with single wall carbon nanotubes, uh, this is a very uh, exciting approach because the nanotubes can still remain very long. Uh, so these, these can be made up to, to my, uh, many microns or even millimeters long. Uh, but you can actually make these, these uh, well-defined structures of nanotubes. Uh, actually, we ended up using this device structure as being uh, an uh, infrared optical sensing device. Uh, to replace mercad tel uh, op infrared optical sensors in, in airplanes, for example, and because the nanotubes absorb strongly in the infrared. And you get two, two types of information. You get polarization as well as the, the strong, uh, you can get basically little grid points here, uh, which are pixels in an infrared optical sensing device. But ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I ended up making a lot of neat devices out of this, terahertz devices, et cetera, uh, which I can discuss with you uh, at a later point if you're interested. Uh, but the, the downfall of this contact transfer approach was simply that uh, the, in, uh, the electrical interface between the nanotubes and the surface they're transferred to uh, was never really that good. Uh, so I could actually make good electrical interface by uh, functionalizing the, 
uh, excuse me, good mechanical interface by functionalizing the surface. Uh, for example, in silicon, you can functionalize it with an APTS or aminopropyl triethoxysilane, where an amine sticks up and grabs onto the nanotubes. Uh, but that destroys the electrical interface, of course. So I had to figure out a different way to do that. And so this is actually what I decided on. And so this is basically, uh, I would take the single wall carbon nanotube array, uh, simply deposit a thin layer of titanium, which is an adhesion layer, uh, and then I deposit a, a thicker layer of gold between 40 and 70 nanometers. And then I take my conductive substrate, as you can see here, uh, and do the same thing. Uh, deposit the Thai gold layer on that as well. And then I put it inside of a, 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 a furnace uh, with argon flowing in the background and heat it to about 750 degrees C. What happens is that this gold layer sinters together, uh, and that forms a really good electrical and actually ohmic interface between the nanotubes and the, uh, the copper in this case. And so you, what you can see in these, these SCM images uh, is the fact that the, the nanotube alignment is still retained in this structure, uh, and the, the, the nanotubes are, are uh, uh, in an excellent template for energy devices. And so the, these materials are very highly conductive in some control experiments. We basically use these as little adhesive tapes because they're like little nano Velcro tapes. Uh, what I found out is when you put them together, the resistivity you can calculate is within a factor of five or so of that which you can, you can, you can get from just doing the copper by itself, um, pushing them together. So now the idea is, okay, let's make some energy devices. So what, what do we make? Uh, and the first thing I thought of was energy storage. This is a great material architecture for energy storage. So in terms of thinking about uh, energy storage, this is the typical design for an electrode in an electric double layer capacitor. And the idea of an electric double layer capacitor is that you have a very high surface area electrode, and you, ha you actually have two of them. Uh, you have a separator in between. You smash it together with an electrolyte. You apply a voltage, and you actually store a lot of charge at the interface, uh, at the high surface area interface with the electrolyte due to the formation of this double layer. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I have a really high surface area material with these single wall carbon nanotubes. And so what if I was able to transcend the idea of a parallel plate capacitor, right, where you have two, two plates with a dielectric in the middle and, and sort of think about it in the context of thicknesses corresponding to uh, the length scale of, of these, uh, uh, these electric double layer. So that, that was the idea, is to merge the two concepts together to make a uh, classical capacitor in the framework of uh, electric double layer capacitor. And so the benefit of this design is that compared to uh, electric double layer capacitors, which depend on electrolytes, uh, so the electrolyte depends on where you can operate this device. So if you, if you go put this thing in space, for example, the electrolyte won't work. If we put it in too high of a temperature, the electrolyte will degrade. Uh, whereas in this, in, with a solid state material, the dielectric material can be operated in many different types of conditions. So you could put this up into a satellite and put it in space, or you could put it underneath the, the hood of your vehicle, or you could stick it in a solar panel next to a desert, or stick it next to a solar panel in the desert, uh, for example, and it would still operate as a capacitor in each case. The other thing is that this, this design is more compatible with on-chip uh, system. So you could actually integrate this into sort of on-chip energy storage materials uh, where you don't want to put uh, an energy storage device that has something like sulfuric acid, which is a common electrolyte uh, for these types of systems. And, and you know, most Fab Lab people, uh, you know, ma many of these device, uh, device companies would, would cry if they had to put uh, sulfuric acid into their system. Uh, but the other thing is that from one end to the next, these single wall carbon nanotubes retain single molecule conduction properties. Uh, and and the, the dielectric enables uh, better breakdown characteristics. So, uh, so the thing here is, is, before I got into this, I wanted to be able to test the waters of whether this device actually makes sense. Uh, th does it actually make sense if this should work or not? So I sat down and, and did some calculations. Uh, and so putting together a simple model, uh, basically uh, calculating this based on the electrostatic capacitance and the quantum capacitance, you know, uh, taking a bundle of single wall carbon nanotubes of 16 or 20 nanometers and surrounding it by a dielectric thickness uh, that, that, that's variable, I was able to come up with these numbers by scaling, uh, scaling a single bundle to the, to the actual material we're working with based on things like mass density. Uh, and, and this is what I get. And so the, the energy density uh, over here is, is what we, we, you, can, you can typically find reported for something like batteries or electric double layer capacitors. And a value of between 10 to 15 is actually pretty good. I mean, it's not, 
Uh, so f to give you a feeling for this, uh, some of the best electric double layer capacitors have had between 70 and 100 watt hours per kilogram energy density. Uh, and, and this clearly isn't there, but a moderate supercapacitor will have you know, 10 watt hours per kilogram. So I thought you know, that's, that's a pretty good number. So uh, it made sense to go along with it. But actually what I decided to do was to stick with aluminum oxide. And even though it's predicted to have worse performance, the thing is, uh, the coating technique I'm using, uh, which I decided on atomic layer deposition, uh, it's a layer by layer type process for building up uh, metal oxides. Uh, it's, it's a very straightforward chemistry. It's one of the very first chemistries and, and, uh, for, for atomic layer deposition. And so that, that's, that's what I chose. And so what I did is uh, I, I worked with Professor Roy Garden's group at Harvard uh, for a brief period of time. And we, we, we basically coated these bundles of carbon nanotubes with both aluminum oxide uh, as well as aluminum dope zinc oxide. And the aluminum dope zinc oxide in this case is the counter electrode uh, for the device architecture. So it's conductive. Now, of course, when I, when I did the first experiments, it was, it was interesting because when I made the device and I went and tested it, I found that these things were very good resistors. And what I had to convince myself is that I was getting pinholes in the process of coding, which is always an issue in this case. But what I found to be the case is that uh, between the aluminum oxide, actually two sequential coatings of aluminum oxide, I can just go do an oxygen plasma treatment. And what oxygen plasma will do is it will burn away the carbon uh, that's exposed in those pinholes. And so when you do coat the counter electrode, you, you don't create shorts in your device. Uh, because if you have your carbon nanotubes uh, coated directly with counter electrode, of course, your whole device is shorted. And of course, this isn't a capacitor. So that's, that was a, a key step in order to do this. Uh, but there's, there's uh, a lot of interest in this because these materials are really well suited for this uh, based on their high surface area architecture. Um, and so here's some TEM images. Unfortunately, this one is a little hard to see, uh, the contrast. But this one, what you can see uh, here is that there's, here's a very uh, clear single wall carbon nanotube bundle. The microstructure or the nanostructure in here you can see is, is uh, single wall carbon nanotubes within the bundle. And that's coated with a, a layer of aluminum oxide. Now, what you may be able to see down here in this structure, this is actually a nanocapacitor, which has aluminum oxide and aluminum dope zinc oxide. Ideally, if, you could, uh, if the contrast was good, you could see that this one is much darker emphasizing it is, it is actually uh, uh, conductive in, in the bright field. So this is actually what they look like in SEM. And so they, uh, compared to the images I showed you earlier, they look more like these, these sort of nano rods instead of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes. And, and so that's very good. And I've, I've done a lot of SEM imaging to emphasize uh, both destructive and uh, you know, just after coding to, to take a look at the structure of these and, and to find that the, the coding was, was pretty uniform on the nanotube arrays. So uh, once I did this, the thing is, is OK, what is the capacitance? Uh, one of the ways that you can extract the capacitance from these structures is to simply do a frequency-dependent uh, measurement of the complex impedance and fit this to some equivalent circuit model. Uh, you know, and you can do this via a program such as PSPICE, uh, where you can, you can extract from that, given a, a good equivalent RLC circuit model in this case. Of course, this looks like a bandpass filter. Uh, you can extract the capacitance. The other thing is you can measure this directly from an impedance meter uh, or an LCR meter and extract out the capacitance of this. So one of the key things about this is that uh, compared to a dielectric, uh, excuse me, compared to an electric double layer capacitor, uh, it takes up to 10 seconds to charge this thing. So the concept of actually using this for high frequency energy storage, which you may think about wanting to use for on-chip energy designs or on-chip energy storage design, designs, uh, where you have a fast switching type of system, uh, it, it, it doesn't really work. Whereas for a solid state device architecture, uh, this may be more feasible. And what I ended up getting is capacitance values that were pretty good. So in the range of 20 millifrads per centimeter cubed, which gave values of up to about uh, half a watt hour per kilogram in terms of energy density. So uh, where are we at in terms of uh, the capacitance values? So this is a theory plot I showed you earlier. And so these are the experimental points. Uh, so within sort of the margin of error, of, of the experimental measurement, or excuse me, of the theoretical values, uh, the, the experiment seems to be uh, reasonably comparable. And to give you a feeling in terms of, so this is called the Ragon plot. We're looking at energy density as a function of power density for all the different types of energy systems. Uh, what, what you can see is that uh, this, this behaves sort of in the range in terms of energy density that would be expected for something that's crossed between a double layer capacitor and a, and a classical capacitor. Um, but it turns out, if, if, if you did a couple of modifications to the system, let, let, let's say that, you know, in, in theory, it's very easy to put in parameters to the system. 
uh, without going through the very difficult experiments. So let's say that you use titanium oxide, first of all, as your dielectric material. And then you, you say, okay, well, I'm going to make the, the bundles a little bit smaller. I'm going to make the, the, the nanotube diameters themselves a little bit smaller. Uh, and so what you end up with is, is sort of uh, a value that's significantly higher based on these, based on these perturbations. Uh, and what, what you can get is, is, a, is a value for energy density that's comparable to something like fuel cells, which is really exciting because this option gives you uh, the, the, uh, a hope for high power density and high energy density types of energy storage systems, which don't currently exist right now. And so now let's say that you're, you, you did optimize the system. Uh, what's next? And so you can actually think of using this printing process uh, that I worked out in order to make uh, sort of on-chip energy storage device designs. And so now what you can imagine is that uh, these, these, these little uh, lines here are actually uh, areas where you're, you're building up supercapacitors or dielectric capacitors on a, on a chip. Uh, and you can put components between these, uh, between these features or you can even uh, uh, code this whole structure and then, and then put components on top. And so this is a very, very exciting way for sort of integrating this into uh, MEMS or uh, robotics or, or even things like cell phones, where, for example, when you, when you use your cell phone, it'd be advantageous to couple a capacitor with a battery uh, if, if you had a uh, good, good performance capacitor. Because in, in your cell phone, your battery pack size is determined by the power of your cell phone when you're actually using it, right? Uh, so if you, had a, if you had a super capacitor that gave you the power for usage state, uh, then you could, actually, uh, you could actually have a smaller battery size that would cover the idle state of your, of your, of your cell phone usage. So this is, a, this is a pretty exciting step forward, I think. And there's, there's still certainly a lot of work to be done, but it's very promising. Uh, it's a very promising direction. OK, so now I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit. Uh, and instead of, instead of talking about energy storage, I'm going to be talking about energy harvesting. OK, and specifically about solar energy harvesting. Now, you may have seen a plot like this before where it's proposed that uh, with the amount of sunlight that hits the Earth, uh, all we would need in order to create all the energy or harvest all the energy that we as humans use on a normal basis is to put solar cells in desert regions that are, that are listed here. Uh, but what you may find uh, by, by, these, by, these, by these red circles or, or red squares, but what, what you may find, though, is that this becomes a more complicated problem because not only are you just generating energy, but you also have to get the energy from where you generate it to your home, right? So you have to put in a global grid system in order to make this work, and that's extremely expensive, much more expensive than the solar cells themselves. So you say, well, okay, can we just use batteries? Can we just couple this with a battery system? But then you actually have to transport the batteries, and that, that's, that even makes less sense. So what my argument is, is that in, in terms of uh, in terms of solar, it makes a little bit more sense to think about this currently in terms of solar to fuel. So if we use solar to actually create a stable fuel that we can use as an energy source, uh, which is feasible, then we could, use, we could basically set up a little uh, power plant out in the middle of the ocean, and we have all the, the infrastructure in place to transport it, either by, by ship or, or on land, uh, if it's going to replace coal, oil, and natural gas by the year 2100. And so, of course, you, you can even see that there's even hydrogen gas, tank, gas stations popping up in Europe. Uh, but the, the argument for this is simply that you're, you're still not getting around the fact that the semiconductor materials have to be cheap. Uh, in order to do this, the semiconductor materials themselves have to be cheap enough to compete with coal, oil, and natural gas to replace them. OK, so when I talk about solar to fuel, what am, I, what am I talking about? Just to give you a heads up. So the idea is that you're putting a semiconductor into a solution, an aqueous solution, uh, in this case, something like salt water, and you're, sh you're shining sunlight onto it, and uh, the, the semiconductor will have the energetics so that you're able to split water into both oxygen and hydrogen. Of course, the, the oxygen goes off into the air, and we like to breathe it. Uh, it makes us happy, whereas the hydrogen we can store in hydrogen, uh, uh, hydrogen tanks and use it in hydrogen fuel cells, and the end result is uh, we only have a byproduct of water that's created as opposed to uh, CO2 emissions from combustion processes. So the end of the goal, at the end of the day, uh, you have to have good stability of the material in aqueous conditions, of course, because it's in aqueous conditions. Uh, but then you have to have the same thing, materials cost and device efficiency. OK? And just to give you a feeling for, for sort of a physical view of what's going on, uh, what, what, you're, 
what the, the concept of this is not much different than a solar cell. The idea is you're exciting an electron hole pair, and so in this case, uh, it's a p-type semiconductor, so the minority carrier is an electron, uh, and that minority carrier goes into solution uh, as opposed to a solar cell where you're just harvesting that carrier off. In this case, that goes into solution and performs a, a chemical reaction. And in this case, the, the energy of the band gap of the semiconductor material has to be bigger than the redox couple of, of the, the chemical reaction that you're, you're, uh, you're, you're aiming for. And so in this case, for water, the redox couple is about 1.23 eV. Uh, but it turns out that in order to uh, actually get this chemistry to work, you have to have band gap energies of about 1.6 to 1.7. Uh, these are over potential uh, energy conditions that you need. So what you're looking for is band gap material or semiconductor materials that have this band gap range that are uh, stable in water. So now I want to I want to share with you this quote. And you know, in terms of thinking about solar to fuel, uh, you you may be interested in this, and I, I want to give you a view of this from a hundred years ago. Uh, and so this is a quote that uh, 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 this scientist came up with and published in Science. And I, I love this quote because it gives you such a visual image of, of where this can be going. And so the, the way it is, is, so it says, on the arid lands there will spring up industrial colonies without smoke and without smokestacks. Forests of glass tubes will extend over the plains and glass buildings will rise everywhere. Inside of these will take place the photochemical processes that have thereto have been the guarded secrets of the plants but that will have been mastered by human industry, which will know how to make them bear even more abundant fruit than nature, for nature is not in a hurry and mankind is. So I, I really love this quote, and it, it puts into perspective where all this is going, in, in my view, uh, in terms of both uh, carbon dioxide to fuel, which is a concept that I will be pursuing uh, per, uh, as a prospective faculty, as well as uh, formation of hydrogen. Okay, so now getting into the, getting into the bulk of the results, uh, what, what is of interest in order in, in terms of these materials uh, for research? Well, uh, I'm comparing this to photovoltaics because photovoltaics are, are relatively well known at this point. Uh, we make them in industry, and it's, it's pretty well established. And in photovoltaics, what you do, uh, it's, it's very standard processing. And the photovoltaics, you just spin on a coating of, of a, of a, of a liquid-based material, which dries and, and forms an anti-reflection coating that, that goes on top of the, the photovoltaics before you put on the glass layer. Uh, and that's a very common concept. So this goes in the very top contact of the, of the photovoltaic system. But you can't really do this in photoelectrochemistry because in photoelectrochemistry, if you put some layer on top of the semiconductor and then you put it in solution, uh, the key point in a photoelectrochemical system is that your PN junction is created between the interface of the semiconductor and the electrolyte, right? And, and so you can't play the same trick with photoelectrochemical systems. So in, in order to harvest the extra photons that would normally be reflected off in a uh, photovoltaic or in, in a flat surface, you actually have to make the semiconductor itself texturized and anti-reflective. The other key thing that's, that's at the forefront of the field is how do you optimally collect carri carriers from these, from these geometries? And so you may, you may have seen work on uh, three-dimensional nanopillar arrays for, for photovoltaics. And the idea is that you get enhanced carrier collection in this architecture. And so people are really looking at this for photovoltaics. People haven't done much in photoelectrochemistry uh, because it's really sort of a re-emerging field uh, in, in this sense. And there are sort of urban myths out there that say, well, if you have more surface area, you can do more reactions. Uh, but but that, things aren't really well, well known at this point. So what have I been doing? Uh, so uh, what, I, what I started with is growing these vertically aligned carbon nanofibers. Uh, so these aren't carbon nanotubes. They're, they're much larger diameter than carbon nanotubes. And they're grown on a conductive substrate. And in this case, the, the catalyst layer is deposited on a very thin titanium layer, uh, which is directly sitting on a 200 nanometer thick layer of copper. Uh, so the interface here is, is conductive. Now, uh, when, you, when you expose a material architecture like this to liquid, what happens is that as, as molecules dry out of the structure, you have forces between these nanoscale objects that cause them to condense together. We call these elastocapillary forces. Or in, in, in terms of a MEMS framework, uh, these are often call, called stiction forces. Um, and, and so usually these are a nuisance uh, for, for many systems. But what, what you can do is you can actually tailor both the length of the carbon nanofiber, the density of the carbon nanofibers, as well as the surface tension of the liquid in order to use this to make anti-reflective device architectures as, as sort of bottom-up templates to build up solar devices. And so this is what I've done here. So this is the uh, aligned carbon nanofiber array, and these are the, the texturized carbon nanofiber arrays. 
Uh, now, there's a couple of really key benefits to this. So these, you can see these have texturized into these sort of pyramidal structures uh, that are uh, really well defined. The benefit to this is that it's a solution process, so it's very scalable. But the thing that limits the scalability in this process is the growth process it's, it's itself. And if you can do that on large scale, then ultimately you can texturize on large scale as well. Uh, and it creates a really excellent template uh, that forms an abrupt interface with the semiconductor where you can code any semiconductor that you want on top of this. And so this is a template for this, this, uh, this solar to fuel device. So in terms of coding semiconductor materials, uh, what sort of semiconductor materials uh, uh, do, should I use? Well, uh, there's a lot of them out there, but uh, it turns out that by using atomic layer deposition, once again, uh, titanium oxide is a pretty good choice because the chemistry is relatively straightforward, uh, and it's a good material for photoelectrochemical systems. So it's very stable in aqueous conditions and in a variety of different acidic media. And you can see here, uh, the, the coating is, is pretty uniform. So I actually coated it uh, in thickness increments corresponding to the minority carrier diffusion length uh, distance in, in titanium oxide. Uh, and so what I'm, what I'm doing in this case is using titanium oxide not as a really high efficiency system, but really as a system to understand the, the benefit of a structure, uh, the three-dimensional structure in these device architectures. So. <clears throat> So now when I went to test these devices, uh, what, I, what I'm measuring here is the short circuit current density uh, under illumination. And so the short circuit current density is simply if you put the sample in the solution and you, you shine a, a, a light or shine, shine solar radiation, uh, one sun of solar radiation on the sample, uh, you're measuring the photocurrent that's generated without applying an external voltage. And so what I did is I compared this to a titanium oxide layer coated on a planar graphite, uh, planar graphite material. And this is pressed graphite, uh, so it's, it's very conductive. And what you can see here is that you get a, I get a three times enhancement uh, for the short circuit current density, which is, which is pretty incredible uh, for the three-dimensional structure as a function of thickness. And on top of that, I can get some really good efficiencies. So these are the efficiency. The efficiency gets up to about 1.15%. Uh, now, comparable to the best reported efficiency for titanium oxide, which is about 1.1%, uh, this is actually pretty good. Uh, so it's, it, this three-dimensional architecture gives a really nice uh, route to making high efficiency devices. But the question is, is why are they so good? So I, I started getting into looking into this. Uh, so I, I measure the reflectance of these structures to determine uh, what role does the reflectivity play in the enhancement to these devices. And it turns out that in the, in the region where titanium oxide will be absorbing, you're getting an extra maybe 14% photons absorbed into the anti-reflective device architecture. Now, the really neat thing, though, is that these, these uh, three-dimensional uh, texturized carbon nanofibers are, by all means, completely anti-reflective which is kind of fun. So they're about 0.4% 0, 0 uh, uh, reflective. But if that's only giving me a, a 1.2 times enhancement uh, due to 14% more photons, where does the three times enhancement come from? Uh, and that's, that's a question that I got into. Uh, and I've done a number of control experiments. And I want to share with you the result in light of time. Uh, and so ultimately, what happens in this case is, well, you can say there's more surface area. And I would argue that that really isn't playing a role, simply because if you have more surface area, you're not absorbing more photons with a simple different device structure. right? Uh, but you can say, well, if the diffusion length is really long, an electron hole pair can diffuse to a surface. Uh, but in this case, in titanium oxide, the, the diffusion length, in, in most cases, is shorter than the thickness of the material. So uh, that's not really a consideration. But what is a consideration is that if you take one of these nanofibers and you coat 100 nanometers of, of, of titanium oxide onto it, uh, and now you, you put it up at some uh, uh, out-of-plane angle that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of demonstrating over here, you put it up at some out-of-plane angle, then for incident light coming down onto the device, the thickness is not the real thickness. The, the effective thickness is, is what I'm showing you right here, is what many of the photons see. And so what this yields to you and so this is, this is what I'm talking about, the effective thickness. And I've modeled this here as well using a simple geometric argument. Uh, what this emphasizes is that you end up increasing the effective optical path length of light in the semiconductor. Or on another note, if you look at this a different way, you're, you're absorbing more light closer to the point where you're actually going to be collecting the carriers into the solution or at the PN junction. 
So uh, many of you may be familiar with, with uh, uh, plasmon-enhanced solar cells. And the idea is you put particles on top of your device, and you scatter light into your device, and you increase the effective optical path length. But this is a much more controlled way of doing this, simply because you can control this property simply by structure and not by arbitrary scattering. And, and so this is a, a very exciting way of making uh, 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 enhanced device architectures. Uh, and, and so this is the, uh, I'm in the process of, of doing detailed modeling of this process now. But this is, this is uh, an exciting idea that, that people haven't shown before for three-dimensional structures. Okay, so now finally, uh, what I'm going to get into with you is the idea of making solar devices it, using three-dimensional architectures, but going a different route. Instead of defining the template and then building the solar device up from that, I'm going to use a material that's, that's quite nice, uh, indium phosphide, even though it's expensive, but let's look past that for the time being. Uh, use a material that's quite nice and, and basically make a three-dimensional architecture from the top down. So uh, using these silicon oxide beads, uh, you can form a nice monolayer on top of the surface. And then you can go and use reactive ion etching in order to basically, by brute force, uh, very energetic reactive ions. Uh, you, can, you can basically beat in to this structure, uh, this sort of nanopillar architecture. And what you end up with is something that goes from a planar wafer, as you can see here, uh, to something that is visibly black. And so what that means is that you can very visibly see that it's, it's not reflecting uh, photons off the surface. You can also see this in the reflectance measurements. So here the band gap is 1.3 eV, so you get more absorption. So you know, let's, let's, let's look at the, the device performance of this. Well, if you look at the, the device performance, uh, without doing anything else, just making the devices for the palladium, uh, for the indium phosphide nanopillars, uh, you can see that the short circuit, so at zero potential, the short circuit behavior is not very good. Uh, but out here, you can see an enhancement uh, due to the, the, uh, the pillar structures, the anti-reflective structure of the devices. Now, what you can do now is instead of using the indium phosphide, you can use a catalyst. And the role of the catalyst in this case is to remove the overpotential condition of actually forming hydrogen. Uh, and, and it will actually allow you with a, a material that has a band gap close to the redox potential of water, so a redox potential is 1.23 eV, uh, and the band gap of indium phosphide is 1.3 eV, uh, you can actually get water splitting results, uh, get water splitting behavior uh, from in, uh, palladium on top of the nanopillars. And so excitingly what we see is a relatively high efficiency uh, for this device architecture. So we see up to about an 8% efficiency for this device. And more excitingly, we see again another 2.5 times enhancement to the total uh, device performance, which is consistent with what we saw before. Now ideally what we'd want to do from this is to coat indium phosphide using something like uh, uh, metal organic uh, CVD processes onto the texturized carbon nanofiber arrays. And that's ultimately a little bit more scalable and, and of course, cheaper. OK, so uh, just to wrap up here, uh, before I stop, I, I, I want to sort of share with you my, my plans, what I'm, what I'm going to be uh, hopefully working on here. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm excited about is the ability to use these vertically aligned single wall carbon nanotube arrays to make uh, three-dimensional batteries. And moreover, utilize a process like atomic layer deposition to actually coat uh, the structure uh, with both uh, lithium-containing metal oxide, like lithium cobalt oxide, an electrolyte, and ideally also an, uh, an anode material uh, in order to make a, a, a structurally robust uh, material architecture. And now you could integrate this material into uh, mobile uh, or portable energy storage applications, such as in reinforced carbon fiber composite materials uh, that, that you, you typically have in aircraft or uh, you know, in terms of uh, fiberglass uh, materials that, that you, you typically use in, in vehicles. So that's, that's one key thing I'm going to be focusing on. I think that's very exciting. The other thing, uh, the other two things, uh, the other 50% of my time will be uh, in focusing on how to convert carbon dioxide into hydrocarbon fuels. And particularly, uh, there's some very exciting results out there now uh, that don't have much scientific backing that have seen uh, uh, plasmon-enhanced photocatalytic effect. I really want to push the envelope to understand this plasmon-enhanced photocatalytic effect and try to engineer it to make systems that will give you a photo photocatalytic conversion of carbon dioxide to fuels uh, very efficiently. The very last thing uh, that I'm going to be trying to do is to make very high efficiency uh, photovoltaic devices using very cheap 
semiconductors. And the idea is to use light management. So the, the concept of photovoltaics is that you make the semiconductor to the, the, the photon, right? You tailor it to the photon. But my, my emphasis is that we have the ability to now tailor photons to semiconductors. And when you do that, you can, you can play with the physics in order to use very cheap materials. And, and that's, that's, that's a very exciting route, I think. OK, uh, so this is my conclusions. Uh, I first showed you a way to transfer uh, carbon nanotube arrays. And particularly, to make energy devices, I showed you a way which we could transfer them in order to make these, these uh, electrically addressable uh, self-assembled carbon nanotube array materials. Uh, and then I, I utilized this material in order to make uh, supercapacitors uh, using atomic layer deposition, which pr have promise of both high energy density and high power density. Uh, which is exciting for things like on-chip applications. Then I moved into solar device architectures where we were converting, using sunlight to convert water into uh, hydrogen fuel. And using three-dimensional architectures in both cases, both using titanium oxide and carbon nanofibers, as well as uh, indium phosphide nanopillars, uh, in some cases coated with palladium nanoparticles. Uh, and in both cases, we found a very exciting result, which is that we get this big enhancement factor just by the 3D structure itself. Uh, which, which is quite exciting, between two and, uh, 2.5 and 3 times. Uh, so with that, um, I want to thank you for your attention. Just to give you a, a, a visual feeling for the place where I work, uh, this, is, this is Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and so this is, this is overlooking the Bay Area. So uh, this is where I do a lot of my research, and so I look out quite often and see views like this, and so I, I want to share that with you. It's especially beautiful uh, on, on sunset when the sky turns red. Uh, so if you ever come out to the area, uh, I would suggest for you to come up to the LBL and, and take a look at the beautiful view. So thank you very much. We had a sunset just last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, can you uh, describe what the what the main things are that allow you to get much higher performance out of them? So the the key thing in in that device architecture that allows you to get high performance is a very high surface area that you have in order to put down the dielectric material coating. So with these carbon nanotube arrays, you have a 15 nanometer diameter bundle, and you have a total of about five to seven percent total carbon density. Um, so ultimately, you have a surface area that is uh, significantly more than between four and 500 times that of a flat surface. Uh, and so it's a, it's, it's a very large surface area, uh, comparable, comparably. Uh, so at that sense, the very high surface area is what promotes you to have high performance, simply because, uh, in, in that sense, the device performance, the amount of energy you can store is, is directly related to the amount of surface area that you have in the device. In a, in a multi-layer ceramic capacitor, you're doing the four or five hundred times by doing four or five hundred layers. That's right. Yes. Can you also do four or five hundred layers with this? I, I well, ideally you could do a few layers, uh, but ultimately you start having the layers run into each other, uh, and then you're just limited by the the amount of density in the nanotube array. That, that it is an in, a, an interesting engineering problem is you know you can tune the density between something like you know these low density carbon nanofibers. Uh, up to single wall carbon nanotubes, which are very high density, whereas the carbon nanofibers are low density. And ultimately, you could go from you know, a multi layer structure uh, with the carbon nanofibers and, and sort of find the sweet spot in there as to where, where that, the device uh, performance is optimized. So, uh, right, right now, between the nanotube bundles and the single wall carbon nanotube arrays, you have maybe between 100 and 150 nanometers of space on average, right? So, I'm saying that you can build up you know, maybe, maybe two at most layers in this particular device architecture. But you can tune the density to be lower, right? Where you get the 3D benefit, but you could still build up more layers. And it'd be interesting to know whether there would be some sweet spot in there where you get enhanced performance by having a multi-layer capacitor in a three-dimensional architecture, as opposed to, uh, uh, does, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I follow where all of the orders of magnitude come from. In the difference between what's available on the market now and the, you know, 
factor of 400, but you're showing more like six, seven orders of magnitude. So I'm not following all of where that comes from. So in, in terms of the, so, so you're saying here, the, the orders of magnitude better? Is that what you're, what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, so here the, the benefit is, is that you're able to, so the capacitance of the structure is directly related to the capacitance between the carbon nanotube bundle and the dielectric material outside. And so the idea is that the, the capacitance is, is not just sort of the classical capacitance that you get from, from a, long, a long wire, coaxial wire, right? So you actually get a quantum capacitance contribution uh, from the carbon nanotubes inside of the bundle as well, right? And, and so as you make the diameters of the nanotubes smaller, you don't change the quantum capacitance much more. But you're packing more quantum capacitance in per volume. And so in this model, you know, you're, you're, you're considering the quantum capacitance of the, of the nanotubes in series with the electrostatic capacitance of the, of the long coaxial wire. And that's what results in a reasonably higher capacitance value. As you change the bundle diameter to be smaller, uh, as well as changing the, uh, the, the carbon nanotube uh, diameter itself also to be smaller, because the, the quantum capacitance itself does not change very much based on nanotube diameter. So, so you're getting to a range where the, the dielectric material actually doesn't matter as much, but it's more than... Yeah, I, ideally. I mean, that, that's an interesting range to think about. Uh, you know, the consequences of it. And, I mean, that, that may essentially be a consequence of that system as well, yes. Yes. Uh, so I have a, uh, a related question about measurement of this uh, capacitance. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're still, uh, in this equation, you're still using this uh, coaxial model, right? That's and right. Okay, so, so basically, uh, when, uh, the way that I do the capacitance measurement is that, of course, these are on a conductive substrate. So I have one probe sort of on the bottom of, of the, the system. And then you have the, the dielectric coating, which is uh, on, on, on top of the whole structure, right, on top. And then what I do is I go through with uh, a very dilute HCl and basically etch away the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the conductive material here in this region so I don't short the device by coating it from the bottom. Uh, and then basically you're measuring the capacitance uh, from here, which is a conductive region, through the dielectric, uh, which goes through this whole nanotube material. And then I put a little bit of silver paint on top uh, in order to make the top contact. And of course the silver paint is, conduct, uh, is, is, uh, is connected electrically to the aluminum doped zinc oxide. And so what you're doing is you're probing the capacitance of the whole structure as, as electrons can go into the, or holes can go into the aluminum doped zinc oxide as well to the top contact. Yeah, so, so, so I was wondering, uh, in your talk, you also put the actual directly, uh, directly covering the core uh, of the bundle, right? So does that create any, create any short between? So it doesn't create any short as long as the aluminum oxide layer is everywhere, or the dielectric layer is everywhere and there's no pinholes. And so in order to get a capacitor device performance, okay, okay. Uh, so, so, so that's right. That's that's right. That's right. Yes, that's right. So uh, basically, the, the idea is that, OK, you, know, you have this band gap of, of the material. Uh, and the idea is when you absorb a, an electron hole pair, uh, what happens in a typical semiconductor is that the electron hole pair quickly thermalizes down to the band gap energy. And so you're only utilizing, uh, you're only utilizing uh, sort of electron hole pairs that have band gap energy uh, 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 type, of, type of values. 
Uh, so the question is, uh, if you could actually make a system where, uh, for example, in quantum dots, where you get quantum confinement in, in all directions, uh, the relaxation times for the electron hole pairs are, are much, much longer uh, than, than in classical systems. And so you can actually harvest these hot electrons off before, before you, uh, before you uh, uh, let them relax. And so in terms of, in terms of that, uh, I don't see why that shouldn't be possible as long as the energetics of the system make sense. So that, that means that as long as the electron, as long as the redox potential of the semiconductor is, is centered around uh, the, or excuse me, the, the band gap of the semiconductor is centered around the redox potential of, of the couple that you're looking at, then the electron hole pair should be pretty uniform about that as well, and you can just harvest that off. Um, in fact, there's a very interesting paper where, where a group has used CAD selenide uh, quantum dots on titanium oxide for visible light harvesting. And there's been a lot of controversy about this paper because they saw CO2 to uh, fuel generation in the visible where titanium oxide is not photocatalytically, ac photocatalytically active. And you know, ultimately, you can read between the lines if, you, if you're thinking about hot electrons and say, well, maybe it's hot electrons. But a lot of people haven't been able to do that. And so a lot of comments and criticism has come to this paper because uh, they don't understand it. But that, I, mean, that, I think that's an exciting route forward for doing photoelectrochemical systems. Yes? Yeah, sure. Uh, your your uh, concept of, of how this would be used is basically putting hydrogen in trucks and trucking them around. That's right. How far are we away from being able to put as much energy in a, in a hydrogen tank truck as we put in an oil tank truck? That, that's a good question, and it really depends on uh, the, the ability to store the hydrogen efficiently. And so I know that there have been a few groups that have achieved the six, per, six weight percent storage capacity using uh, protected uh, metal hydrides, or excuse me, uh, magnesium hydrides uh, as, the, as the storage medium. Uh, so we're, in terms of being quantitative about that in comparison, in terms of the, the energy that you get out of that material in a, in a sort of truck load of it, uh, I, I, I can probably do those calculations and get back to you on that. But uh, it's, it's evolving. Uh, unfortunately, funding sort of drooped on the concept of hydrogen uh, and sort of moved toward electric vehicles uh, more recently. Um, and so now a lot of energies, a lot of uh, funding is being put into batteries as opposed to hydrogen. But ultimately, um, what, what I envision in, in the long term is not hydrogen. Actually, or excuse me, in the short term, is not hydrogen. Uh, I think there's a lot of distance we have to go in order to make hydrogen an effective fuel source. What I do envision, though, is, is ways to make combustion processes renewable. Because right now, combustion is what we use in vehicles, and it's what we transport in, in, in vehicles. And so the idea is that if we can harvest out of sinks of carbon, like the ocean, if we can harvest out carbon dioxide uh, and convert it into methanol, which we know, you know, companies like Shell, you know, they have these zeolite catalysts that convert methanol to gasoline very efficiently. Uh, then that turns into a much more effective route on the short term, whereas hydrogen may be an effective route on the long term because it's clean. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, I think in the short term, it's it's the direction of CO2 to fuel. So. Great, thank you.